to the uttermost when I think about the Lord. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Scope Temple. All right. Let me do these greetings and then I'm going to give you my scope rules. Hello. Hello. Um, hey. Hey, mom. Hey, hey. Okay, it's going real fast. I was trying to catch some names, but it ain't working. Uh, from Florida, from Atlanta. Hello from Juan, Keyshawn, and Keon. I bind that spirit. It needs to only be one of y'all. All right. Pastor K.O., how are you? Thank you very much. She's the diamond. Hello, Mo McCray. Hello from Virginia. <laughs> Mom, I need you to not do that. All right. Nassau is in the temple. All right. Pastor Spencer Church. Good stuff. Good stuff. Hello from Maryland. Hello, Londa from Georgia. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, Stephanie. Hey, Auntie. God bless from Liberty Temple, Chicago. Hello from Louisiana. Love the scope with the kids. Yeah. Uh, Bishop Hillard, how are you, sir? Grace to you, IBW Global. First time visitor. Wow. Welcome to Scope Temple. Travis from Atlanta, how are you? Vicksburg, Mississippi, hi from Vegas. I'm glad to see some righteousness going down in Vegas. <laughs> All right, hey, Prophetess Keisha. Oh, I know you would be on here for this. You, anytime I'm talking about intercession or prayer or something with that, I know you like it. Whew. Let me drink me some water. I have a little parts. Hey, Dr. Emma, hello. First time visitors. Brittany Calvert 4, hello. All right, forgive my caveman look. Um, <laughs> Ma, I'm not available. I'm just not. Yes, I will be in Maryland on Sunday. Um, forgive my caveman look. I look like I've been uh, hidden away in the cave. I'm all fuzzy and furry, but I think it helped me to feel like I'm on sabbatical effectively if I let my mustache and... Um, and, and face grow on out. So I got I got to figure out something. I got to be swaggy. All right. Um, here's what I want you to do. If you on. <laughs> thank you, mom. Uh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to uh, share this with your networks. I'm going to go ahead and talk about something that is very important to me. And um, which is taking your prayer life, prayer life to the next level. And I'm going to be specifically talking about the role of tongues in your personal devotion. And I'm going to clarify some misconceptions, nuances about what the Bible says about speaking with tongues. And now this is very important. I know that this is something that you probably think is more um, specific to intercessors or people that have uh, pu public prayer responsibility, but I'm going to give you insight about how speaking in tongues or praying in tongues can even help you as a leader. Um, and I'm going to just give you a bunch of that stuff. So I'm going to give you some of my personal history. First of all, let me say thank you for all of you for your prayers. I am, um, uh, everybody know I'm, I'm on a, a season of rest. Um, but God is doing so many good things every day. I get good news and that's just how this is set up, uh, for me. But, uh, I need to talk to you about this. Um, I will be in Baltimore, Maryland this Sunday ministering for Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant of the Empowerment Temple AME Church in Baltimore. So if you are in the Baltimore area and um, you are available, come and join me uh, to hear the word of the Lord in God's mind on Sunday. I'm going to be preaching for that man. And um, so I hope you're there. I'm excited to be with him. I'm excited to be mind, body, and style. Good stuff. I'm excited to be with Dr. Bryant. And uh, I'm excited to be on the East Coast for the third time uh, this week. But go ahead and share this. And you know, if um, you um, agree, like, whatever, go ahead and hit them hearts right there. Let's see why we can get this to three million. Um, now, a couple of scope rules for those of you that have never followed me. I um, I know people are going to manifest uh, about this issue of speaking with tongues and you may get a couple of atheist agnostics ignore them as I will unless they get disorderly or unless the Lord gives me a um, 
a word of knowledge for them, as it often happens, uh, but ignore them because you, you're going to get a bunch of people uh, that disagree with some of the things that I say. But my guarantee is that all of what I say is going to be backed up by the scriptures. All right. So let me take you into my journey and let me show you uh, where I um, began with this and um, share with you how it's grown to help me. Number one. Um, I was filled with the Holy Spirit in, in the year 1997, and um, it was weird because I, my particular background, we didn't teach the baptism of the Holy Ghost per se. I, I had no clue about what a Pentecostal was. I, I didn't know anything about the Pentecostal experience. Um, we didn't uh, teach or emphasize that a part of your salvation uh, was the infilling of the Holy Spirit with, with the evidence of speaking with tongues. It wasn't what I came from. And uh, obviously, uh, I had no clue uh, that any of that existed. But um, as a boy, I was always, and my mom is actually on here. She can verify this. But as a boy, I had certain supernatural abilities um, that I didn't necessarily know was supernatural. And that debunks the myth that you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to have the gifts of the Spirit. Now, I don't believe that because we don't have scripture for that. However, uh, in order to move strongly in the gifts of the Spirit and to have them move actually on demand and potently, you do need to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. But the Bible says in, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 um, that God has given to every man gifts of the Spirit. And the Bible says he divided them severally according to what pleases him. So that means that everybody... Uh, when they come to the world, has certain dormant spiritual gifts that are in them that are uh, uh, latent or dormant uh, within them. So anyway, I had uh, certain spiritual things. These I would always get these knowings. Uh, certain stuff would have me. I would have visions of things. Uh, but most commonly, I would um, I would uh, see things. So like I remember having to move from one state to an, to the next. And uh, my most vivid memories as a child are of uh, things that I saw, things that I knew and shouldn't have known or didn't know. So that's code for prophetic. I just always had knowings about stuff. Like I, um, my mom and I had to move a certain southern state. And I remember the day we moved, I saw us on a Greyhound bus earlier that day. And that night at about maybe two in the morning, my mom came and woke me up and we moved back to Chicago from this southern state. Weird stuff like I would just know things. Um, um, so God put a hunger in me as a child, kind of like he did the uh, the prophet Samuel, a very strong hunger uh, in me as a child. I, I, I would dream things. I mean, all of the stuff I just knew. But because we didn't come from a charismatic or spirit-filled background, I didn't really have language for any of it. Um, but uh, God put a hunger in me, a real strong hunger in me about the supernatural because I was looking as a boy. For explanation about what was wrong with me, why was I, why did I feel so alienated and unlike everybody else around me, um, why was there a struggle to fit and why was there a struggle to, to be, uh, and so that turned into a, a deep hunger and a very deep desire and a craving for understanding. Well, one night uh, in, in uh, 1997, I had an experience with God in my room where I, I literally prayed and anybody, my family members would tell you, I was just really weird. Like as a boy, I'm talking about seventh and eighth grade without hyperbole or exaggeration. I, I had anointed oil on my desk. I would carry my Bible to school. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. I was a weird kid. I wouldn't, you know, where the other kids would be outside wrestling and, and, and praying, uh, playing uh, Bang, bang, you know, guns and robbers. I loved wrestling and anything that had to do with mutant or supernatural power. Uh, and I understand now why that was. But I would be in the house either preaching to teddy bears or literally my grandmother had a, a, um, a, um, a what do you call them things? A radiator that I would open my Bible on. And I, I, I learned how to excel even reading by studying the scriptures. It's very unique. So um, one night in 1997... I uh, I asked the Lord, you know, if you're real, feel me. And I had an experience with, with God that day that literally changed my world, changed my life forever. And um, what happened was in that room, while I was praying and worshiping in the room, I felt a presence walk in and I was too young to know that any of this stuff could be made up. Um, but I felt a presence come in my room. And when that presence came in my room, I immediately felt overwhelmed 
to the point where I began speaking with tongues. And I had only seen maybe about two people do it in my entire life. And actually, one of those people might <laughs> might be on here. And those people at my church, one of them was April Haynes Dudley. And the other one was a lady named Gigi who went to my old church and, and they spoke with tongues. But because there was a taboo thing and uh, that was a thing that we didn't really do, I, I thought that the people who spoke with tongues was cursed. So uh, when the Holy Ghost uh, filled me that day without teaching, without a, a Pentecostal upbringing or heritage, he literally came in my room and I began to weep. I didn't, I had no sin consciousness. I had no uh, uh, anything like that, but I began to speak with tongues and I began to speak with tongues almost very fluently. Um, um, I didn't know what to do. And so after that happened, it kind of, you know how you have an experience with God, it kind of scares you. What I did was I turned on the TV and when I turned on the TV, uh, there was a man named Rod Parsley on the TV, and he was talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He had just had a, a service with him and Lester Sumrall, and because that happened to me 30 minutes before, I turned, I spoke with tongues uninterrupted for like 30 minutes, and when I, when I turned on the TV, Rod Parsley was on the TV teaching about being baptized with the Holy Ghost. So I wept, I wept, I wept uncontrollably. Because I knew this guy didn't know me and he didn't know what I was going through or where I was. But after I was filled with the Holy Ghost, that day, the, the Rod Parsley began to speak to me about speaking with tongues through the TV. Weirdest thing in the world. Well, after that happened, you know, went on with life. And because I was in a, a rather traditional uh, church or uh, a, a church that didn't really... Um, uh, believe in uh, a lot of the, the gifts of the spirit, I hid it for a whole two, three, four years. I didn't speak with tongues again. And a lot of times that's a lot of your ex experiences. You know, when you first get the Holy Ghost or you first are filled with the Holy Spirit, you, it sounds crazy to you or you go on your mind like, uh, that can't be real. This, I'm just making this up. So certainly I'm not going to do this. So I didn't speak when I didn't speak with tongues again for literally like two years. And um, I told my great great grandfather in '99 that I was called to preach the gospel, and uh, like Samuel and Eli, uh, I had the conversation with him. He sent me back, uh, told me wait, and if I hear it again, come back to him. And I came back six months later and told him he allowed me to to preach. And uh, after I began to preach, that stuff would just kind of come up. You know, I would I would be. Uh, in an environment where the Spirit of God would get have. And you know how it is when the Spirit of God moves in most uh, traditional settings like that, their response is to dance. So I was a dancer. You know, if you if you touch the right bone today, I still dance. But in that day, um, I spoke with tongues. Now, when I started to hear um, people uh, teach on tongues and different, uh, I wanted to know what the heck is this? What's going on? Uh, you know, what's happening? Um, I start to get into different teachings. And so I heard a bunch of strange stuff. Some of this stuff is stuff y'all probably grew up on. Uh, but I'm going I'm to debunk a lot of that. And one of the, the strange things that I heard um, when looking for understanding about speaking with tongues is that if um, you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. And so I was like, oh, God, I was going to hell before this. And that was the most PAW, apostolic, oneness only, Jesus only movements. If you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. You know, if you don't um, um, get up from the from the water, you know, or, uh, uh, then you, you, you not really save. And then I heard something, uh, where they taught, well, yeah, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. But then another guy told me, and if you, if you get the Holy ghost, or if you get filled with the Holy ghost with the evidence of speaking with tongues without somebody tarrying over you. Now, for those of you that may be unfamiliar with the term tarrying, most specifically my Baptist brethren, some of my Methodists may not know this, uh, even some of our, uh, our Word of Faith brethren may not know this, but basically what they meant was that a mother in the church had to stand over you, make you clap, do like this, you know, and tell you to say, Jesus, 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 some say Jesus, some say thank you, depends on the, 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 uh, the area you come from. And now, and let me just put this out there. Some people, it works. I guess when you have a uh, uh, faith for that, it works. I don't know if that's in the Bible, uh, but I had a guy tell me that uh, if you didn't get it that way, you was a thief and a robber. Now, I'm not shunning that. If it works for you, it works for you. Um, I had an experience. Uh, my aunt Star, 
who's on here somewhere, uh, took me to a church, a Baptist church that had the Holy Ghost when I was probably like 11 years old. And they stood around me and they sang Jesus and something happened to me. I don't know what happened, you know, after that day, I just kind of had a experience with, with God. I was out for like days, it seemed like. But um, anyway, so yeah, it worked. Now, I don't know that it's scripture that somebody stand over you and say, G, 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 G. And and then you be like, and they'd be like, oh, he got it, he got it. Uh, but then there's this weird thing coming on where, you know, um, I think it's heretical, where um people uh um um will what was that going with that? Lord have mercy. Come on. You demon of old age, I bind you. Oh, oh, yeah, what people teaching <laughs> that uh, that's the only way to get the Holy Ghost. Now, my Bible says that it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the, the kingdom. So, you know, he, he's not going to withhold any good thing from you if you ask him for the Holy Ghost. And I never saw in the Bible, and I hate when people testify this, but I've never seen in the Bible uh, where some old lady with a fruit basket or a doily on her head got to tell you, you you wasn't ready for the Holy Ghost. Now, in black church, that's something we love to talk about. Oh, them old mothers, they sure tell you, go on back, baby, you ain't ready. And nobody ever wondered how demonic that was for some lady, however old she was, that ain't died on nobody's cross, that ain't tell you to go away from the promise, can, can look at you and tell you you're not ready for the Holy Ghost. Even if you are in sin, if you're repenting and asking God to fill you with the Spirit, the Bible says he's eager for people to fill him. So a lot of that stuff, although it may be your uh, uh, experiences, I don't know how scriptural it is for somebody to say, go on back. I mean, some of you people need to be delivered from abandonment, disappointment, brokenheartedness, because you've been seeking for the Holy Ghost, and somebody kept telling you at the altar, go on back. You ain't ready. I mean, next time mother asks, t tell you that, ask mother, what in the Sam Houston made you Jesus? Are you the, the fourth member of the Godhead? You can't turn me around. God wants me to have the Holy Ghost. I want to have the Holy Ghost. Anyway, now, a lot of you don't know what, you, what I'm talking about with that, but that, that's good. I'm glad that when you experience it. Now, um, so, yeah, after I came in contact with some balanced teaching, I made it a regular habit of praying in the Holy Ghost. I would, I would, you know, in the in the old Pentecostal tradition, something had to jump on you, and, you you know, the Holy Ghost was like a disease. He was like a coal. You caught him, you know. He jumped on you and pulled you on out of your body, and you only spoke in tongues. When the Holy Ghost came on, you had to feel it. Hiya! You know, and then when you did feel it, you, 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 you quicken real quick and 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 say it uh, uh one real uh tongue hobi shot and that just be kind of it that's all you did you know but it didn't really give us insight about how praying in tongues could really help advance you your prayer life and advance your walk with God and also advance your ability to move the resources of the invisible world the gifts of the spirit etc so they taught it like you know talking in tongues um uh, is something that happens when the Holy Ghost comes on you. But I'm going to tell you a lot of the confusion comes with the variations and the and the kinds of tongues that the Bible talks about. And let me do my best to give you some theological clarity to what the Bible really says about tongues. Now, here is what the Bible really says about tongues. A lot of common questions is, is, is being filled with the whole, is, is speaking with tongues the only evidence of, of being filled with the Holy Ghost? My answer to that would be no. More than likely, it is the initial evidence, but it can't be the only evidence. We have the fruit of the Spirit. Um, we also have where the Bible gives us a signs in Mark 16, 16 through 18. These signs will follow them that believe. Now, tongues is listed with them, but people act like tongues is the only sign of the Holy Ghost. My problem with you people is that if you feel like tongues is the only sign of being filled with the Holy Ghost, then maybe that justifies why you are weak. You don't do miracles. You can't heal people. You don't prophesy. You don't cast out devils. So if you only use tongues for foreign languages, then you missed all the rest of him and you fractured him off and you reduced him to an unknown language and you arrested the rest of the ability that he brought. The Bible also in Galatians 5 talks about the fruit of the spirit, which is not the fruit of the flesh, which means that in order to master the things that the fruit of the spirit brings into your life, you've got to be filled with him for him to resource you to have gentleness, to have patience, to have loving kindness, all of the things that the Bible says. So no, speaking with tongues is not the only evidence of being filled with the Holy Ghost because I know a lot of very demonized very uh, fleshly, very dysfunctional people who are walking around here 
coming to town on a bow tie and they're on their way to hell. So yeah, it's not the only. Now it may be the initial because the the word for filled is the word pleroma. It's the biblical word pleroma, which means to be overwhelmed with. And if you look at the way, if I were to take this bot, this this water uh, cup, and if I were to pour something in it, two things would occur. What was in the cup oxygen, whatever invisible would come out, but a new substance would come in that the, and the response of the substance filling this would be language. Language is the, is the, is the gift of expression and communication. So it's actually genius of God to fill a person with the Holy ghost and the byproduct of that overwhelming experience or the pleroma would be speaking in an unknown tongue. Now, as I take my water now, but here's what the Bible says. So language, here's how it works. The greatest gift of God to the human race is Jesus, the sacrifice, the ruler, the redeemer, the king. But the greater gift of the greatest gift of Jesus to the world was the Holy Ghost. I want to bring a gift to the world, to the human race, to, to let them know my power. So Jesus sent the Holy Ghost. He sent the Spirit. But the greatest gift of the Spirit to the world was power and gifts. But more profoundly than power and gifts was a language that would not only unify believers around the world. See, I'm old school. Even when I talk about the Holy Ghost, my heart starts to tremble. I almost just let something out right there. Let me pull back. <laughs> Which would unify believers all around the world and not only unify them, but give them a, a, a strength and give them a power that would be able to access the powers, the insight, the wisdom, the stamina, the endurance that could only be eternal. So what we use communication for in English, in the natural, is to understand things, to comprehend things. We use communication to move things. I mean, the we use communication to, to, to engage one another. The same is true in the spirit. We use our language in and by the spirit to pull on abilities that are spiritual, pull on strengths that are spiritual, pull on 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 weaponry and 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 uh, insights that are not carnal that are not fleshly so the, the deficit is when paul says stuff like in in the book of romans if you walk in the flesh you will fulfill the flesh or the lust of the flesh and the desires thereof but then he says if you walk in the spirit you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So nobody ever asks about what walking in the spirit entailed. How do you as a person, uh, 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 as a fleshly being, uh, achieve walking and living in the spirit? The Bible says also, if you sow into the flesh, you will of the flesh reap this, right? But then he also says, whoever sows or invests in the spirit. So nobody ever asks, what does it mean to walk in the spirit? What does it mean to sow? How do you sow something in the spirit to reap it? Great questions. Let's get into some of the nuances of tongues. And I'm going to put a pin there and get back there. Some of the nuances of this and some of the people that fight speaking with tongues fight stuff like this. The Bible says, whoever speaketh, S-P-E-A-K-E-T-H, whoever speaketh in an unknown tongue tongue, let him pray also that he may interpret. Now, as I have said on many other periscopes, a lot of the confusion about biblical concepts, and I'm not saying this to be a jerk, is basic reading, okay? It's just basic reading. I don't think that in the body of Christ, we teach enough about comprehension, and we don't teach enough about reading the English language. Because the same author that talked about speaking with tongues, which is to project and to platform myself in such a way where I'm communicating a message to people to comprehend. Whoever speaketh in an unknown tongue, let him pray also that he may interpret. The Baptists fight tongues with that. Some, a lot of people fight tongues with that. But here is the problem. The very same author in the very same chapter says, when I pray in the spirit, my or when I pray in tongues, my understanding is unfruitful. He says, In the spirit, I'm speaking mysteries. No man understands me. So, here are some challenges. The challenge is Is this the same function, administration, or presentation, or manifestation of tongues that he's referring to? 
Is this the same one? And the answer is a resounding no. If Paul says, if I if I pray in tongues, or you know, then and my understanding is unfruitful in the spirit, I'm speaking mysteries. No man understands what I'm saying. Then that cannot be the same administration and the same presentation and the same uh 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 uh, 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 uh manifestation of tongues as he's referring to that took place in Acts chapter two. So. So let's come out of 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14, and let's drive all the way to first Acts chapter 2. Bam. All right. We're in Acts chapter 2. Now, in Acts chapter 2, in the upper room, 120 there, you know, believing on the Holy Ghost. Come, come, come. Wait on the promise. Wait on the promise. Glory. And when the promise shows up, the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance or the ability, all right? The, the ability, right? So when they speak with tongues, what happens is the people that are there listening to them, that are observing them, what do they say in Acts chapter 2? They say, oh my God, we are from uh, the Medes and Persia. How be it? We hear these men speaking to God and praising God in our language. We understand them. So here's the deal. Who interpreted tongues in Acts chapter 2? Wait for it. Wait for it. Peter? Nah. Peter got up and preached and said, no, no. Y'all think that these people are drunk because somehow they have tapped into a, a, a an ability through the arrival of the Holy Ghost or through the the uh, the 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 presentation of the Holy Ghost and nobody stood there and nobody said, "Uh oh, yeah, no." There was a corporate understanding without one interpreter. No one person stood up and said, "This is going on." What Peter did is said, "No, these men are not drunk like you suppose." He said. How uh, he said, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel, that in my name, you know, what I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and daughters of prophets, etc., etc. So there was not one interpretation. There was several nations there that had different interpretations from the different languages being spoken by the 120. So is that the tongues? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 12. Was that the tongues that Paul said, if I pray in tongues, my spirit prayeth. And my understanding is unfruitful. Now, Paul or somebody is a schizo. Because here in Acts chapter 2, we hear and we see where people understood what was being said. And then in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14, he says, When I pray in the Spirit, or when I speak with the tongue, my understanding is unfruitful. How be it who else uh, 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 he says, how be it um, when I'm speaking, I'm speaking mysteries. No man, this is a literal quote, understanding them because in the spirit, he speaketh mysteries. So if, if these are the same tongues, then G Paul didn't get the email, uh, about there being, being a law that nobody can talk in tongues or speak in tongues if there is no interpreter present. So the problem is bad study habits and people who lift and dissect one verse of the scripture to make it mean their point because they're afraid of what it's going to bring. So the answer is this. Paul used those three chapters in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14 to describe several different types of tongues. In Acts chapter 2, you have the tongues of nations, which would literally almost be akin to speaking with tongues and prophecy, which is a different manifestation of the tongues that you probably received when you are filled with the Holy Ghost and that you use for your devotional life. So no, those were not the same exact things function of tongues. There are people who have a gift or a ministry of tongues, like Paul says about interpreting tongues of the nations or what they use in Acts chapter 2, but it's the equivalent of giving a tongue and an interpretation, which is like a prophecy. So when Paul says, I would rather, you know, in the, in the assembly, I would, I would rather speak, you know, five words of my interpretation. What he was saying literally is that it, if I'm going to take a platform and I'm going to address all 500 or however, however many of you are on here, and I just start talking in tongues right now, and I gave you my whole un, uh, message in tongues, then 
Only about two, maybe three of you, if you're lucky, are going to grasp what I'm saying. Most of you are going to be clueless. So no, when I am trying to communicate a message with people or two people, I am not to do that in tongues. So this is not the only administration of tongues. Now, I actually have a gift or a ministry of tongues. I know this is not the same gift because in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, Paul actually lists tongues amongst the officers of the church. So if there was only one type or one level of tongues that and, and all of them were the same, then when Paul says God has said in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, when Paul says God has said in the church, first apostles, signally prophets, after that miracles, uh, I mean, thoroughly teachers, after that miracles and after that tongues, why does he list that tongue with the with the uh the officership of the church so interesting so here is the first theological debunking all tongues are not the same no paul says if i speak in the tongues of men and angels so there's another type of tongues apparently and allegedly per the apostle tall paul there's a certain language a certain verbiage a certain a certain uh, uh a dialect that comes from heaven that the angels speak he says the the tongues of men and angels but then in Acts chapter 2, they call them our tongues. How be it, we hear these men speak the languages of God in our tongue, in our language. So you got the tongues of, you got your devotional tongues, which I'm about to get to. You got speaking with tongues or proclaiming in tongues, which is actually the ability to prophesy. Because if you're going to give a message in tongues, the interpretation is going to come forth as God uh, 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 communicating something in a, in a known language. So, no... In that regard, everybody will not have the gift or the ministry of tongues. Let me just insert this. The reason why you see tongues as the introductory gift of the, of the book of Acts. You don't see the book of Acts start with healing. You don't see the book of Acts start with the casting out of devils necessarily. You don't, have the, you don't see the book of Acts start off with some uh, uh, a rambunctious, boisterous miracle, which I would assume. You see it with the arrival of tongues. Why does the book of Acts start that way? Expedience. God, in his mind, needed to figure out a way to get the same message of the sovereignty and the power and the authority of the unbeatable God, right? He brought that forth and he said, hmm, what's the quickest way I can get all of these various nations represented here being uh, and, and, and employ them into ambassadorship? What's the quickest way to get them to know I'm on the move? This book of Acts is called the Acts of the Holy Ghost. What's the quickest way? I know I'll find a way. Just like in the Tower of Babel, I confuse their tongues to separate them. I'm going to join their tongues now in the New Testament to bring them on the same accord and on the same page with what I'm about to do. So he begins the book of Acts with his arrival of this beautiful language. Why? For the purpose of expedience. He needed to be able to ready the people for movement and movement that were going to happen quickly. Now we see why the Bible says, and God added to the church, what? Daily, such as should be saved. Now now we see why in Acts uh, uh, 2 and 4, they were continuing in the apostles' doctrine and they were getting together. He, What he scrambled in, in, in at the Tower of Babel, he unified through giving us a common language that was not from earth but from heaven. And it would cause things to happen quicker and faster and more syncopated with the rhythm and the rate and the speed of things as they were in heaven. Now. Let's go into devotional tongues. When you are filled with the Holy Ghost, I'm going to say I believe it's God's will that everybody speak in tongues. Now, that's different from having the gift of tongues. Again, the gift of tongues that Paul talks about is the ability to speak supernatural languages, earthly or unknown, because Paul uses, if I speak in other tongues, but then he also uses the term unknown tongues. So if you want to do your own research, do the tongue, do, do the research. The Bible uses these terms, the tongues of men and angels. He uses the term unknown tongues. Now, if a, in a, if a tongue is an unknown tongue, then it, it's not an other tongue because an other tongue means one other than what you speak now. But all other tongues are not unknown tongues and other tongues can come through the gift as well. But these are different administrations. Remember the Bible says that they are the same God, same Holy Ghost, different administrations of the gift. So every gift has just a different administration. And in the gift of tongues, you've got like 20 different administrations of the way this thing works. It's not just that one tongue, ho ba 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 that you get when you get filled with the Holy Ghost and that's it. You you only use it the next time he come on you and you feel it like spider web, you know, all that religiousness. But listen, so Paul talks about unknown tongues, other tongues, and he talks about the, the tongues of angels. So research those terms. They're in the Bible. 
find all of them out and study yourself. All right. Now, what do you think was the resource that escalated Paul routinely from under the pressure of persecution, of, of conflict with the other apostles? You know, he was always in an argument with the with the original 12 because in their opinion he was his new kid on the block and 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 they were traditional uh Jews they they celebrated the feast they you know they didn't believe in in, in touching and affiliating with the gentiles but you got this guy who is a, a a gentile and he's like yo I know Jesus died but uh he showed up to me on on um on on uh, Acts chapter 13, he showed up to me, knocked me off of my horse, right? He showed up to me on Damascus. I saw a bright light. Now I'm an apostle. I'm one of yours, right? And so um, uh, he's always in this war. His his apostleship comes under attack. That's why he's like, you know, I, I am I less an apostle than you guys? I mean, he's fighting with them, you know, his conflict, whatever. He's trying to prove and validate his apostleship. That's a whole lot to be under when trying to validate yourself and being the recipient of a revelation or a depth of revelation that had not heretofore come. Now, let me debunk the myth, this myth about grace. I'm getting somewhere. Just be patient and listen. You ain't got nothing else to do. Um, but uh, <laughs> grace is not a New Testament phenomenon. The, grace is all throughout the word of God. The Bible says in the Old Testament, this, that uh, I think it's in the book of uh, uh, about Haggai or Zechariah, where the Bible talks about how when walls of obstruction came up, that they would scream grace, grace unto the walls that came up. So grace is not new. Grace was how all uh, all the Old Testament prophets performed in the power that they did. It was the power of grace, the abilities of God. But what happened? We entered into the covenant of grace or the age of or, or the of the, or the grace era in the New Testament when the new covenant began, when the Bible says that Jesus uh, sat at the table with the 12 at the last supper and said, you know, a new covenant I make with you, etc., etc. And he goes into all of this. Now, the 11 didn't have the example, didn't have the understanding about the covenant of grace, but Paul would become the recipient of this truth, that this is a, a grace era. He says we are no longer Jew, no longer Gentile. He says we're no longer bound no, nor free. We are no longer, you know, dumb, filthy rag, you know, we not sin us, sin, but what we are, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. He began to teach these revolutionary things. And then he flips the script and starts talking about how we are one part in many bodies. And he begins to decode to us that all ministry gifts are not the same. You got apostles and prophets. And I mean, this man's mind has been touched on by the Holy Ghost. Not only was his mind touched by the Holy Ghost with superior, unparalleled intelligence, and he began to crack open certain truths about God. God, that the Bible says in the book of Ephesians was was uh, otherwise locked up. That was locked up. And the Bible actually says made hidden. Something about the way God made Paul allowed him to tap into stuff that was otherwise hidden and ages, not just to people, but the entire generation, stuff that was hidden. Something about Paul's prayer life must have been that intriguing that it opened up wisdom, it opened up secrets, it opened up mysteries, it opened up insight. Now, here's something else you need to consider. Paul was one of the only apostles that had a category, and I want you to hear this, a category of miracles that that was the what that was the uh, proprietary ownership of his office. It's called the special miracles of Paul. He calls them the spe that means that there was something on Paul's mantle that allowed him to have a species and a type of miraculous power, most of which we don't even describe by the book of uh, in the book of Luke, but a special miracles that attributes to his apostleship. What in the world was the secret to all of that power? I'm going to tell you what it was. Paul says something to the church at Corinth that blessed me. And then in the book of Jude, it talks about the benefits of praying in the spirit as well. What? Uh, Paul says was that I pray in tongues more than all of you. So for those of you people who who want to use everything that Paul said to shut up women and everything that Paul said about grace and all of you people, what they don't realize is that Paul said one of my secrets as a leader is that I pray in tongues. And he said, I pray in tongues more than all of you. Now, when you see that, he, he gives us that little insight in his, his devotional life as a leader. What you end up saying is, aha, uh -huh. 
Maybe this was the source, the power agency. Maybe this was the, the, the dynamos. Maybe this was the energema that fueled his ability to move how he moved and think how he thought. And when he approached the scriptures, maybe that was what allowed him to crack open the hidden mysteries of the prophets of old and find a contemporary use on how to make use uh, and, and meaning and application to what Isaiah, Ezekiel, all of them people said. Maybe this was the insight we need. So he goes into this stuff about praying in tongues more than all of you. But then he says stuff like, you know, I had a vision one day, says Paul, and uh, I don't remember if it was in the flesh or in the spirit, but I remember being called up to the third heaven. Now, I know we look at that stuff like, wow, amen. But imagine having so many supernatural encounters and having so many visitations of Jesus and imagine having so many back to back run-ins with the supernatural world that you can't mem remember if this conversation you had with this guy was in the flesh or if it was in the natural. Imagine how deep that is to have built yourself up to that extent that you take so many trips to heaven and heavenly places that you can't remember <laughs> if you had this vision in the flesh. I mean, so whatever that Paul is showing us about his 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 revelation uh, uh, showed us that he mastered life in two worlds. This is why he can, he can write to us and say stuff like, you are in the world, but you are not of it. He was not writing it just as some proverbial uh, 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 of garbage. He was saying it because I know, Paul says, what it is to be a citizen of heaven living upon the earth. I know what it is to literally be acquainted with the place and the space I was fashioned in and manufactured in, but be deputized and be sent back to a realm governed by time and wickedness and sin and demons and evil. I know what it is, and I know that it's possible to walk in the spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh because something about his devotional life life uh, as a leader enabled him to master what was happening in the spirit and what was happening in the natural. He could do a thing in the spirit and that thing would manifest in the natural. Now all of Paul's teachings make sense. If you pursue the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and his hatred for sin and perversion and then you go all the way into the book of Romans where he's talking about walking in the spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh and he's talking about all this stuff. Where did this stuff come from? His devotional life. Everybody is so impressed by Paul's writings, but those writings poured out from a place. Those discoveries poured out from a place. Those principles poured out from a place. Those visions poured out from a place. Those special miracles poured out from a place. He was literally an eternal creature that took on an earth suit in order to fulfill his purpose and his destiny and to conform to the earth uh, rules in order to bring to fore the things that he would bring to fore on earth in the, in the form of his assignment. So Paul said, I pray in tongues daily more than you all. You understand? And if you lead a church like I lead, then you understand why praying in the spirit is so important for you to unlock wisdom and strength and power and insight and understanding. Now, here's something else. So if, if, if the book of Jude in Jude chapter one, verse 23, if it says, but you brethren pray in the Holy Ghost. Now, if he is 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 talking about just praying until you feel real strong about praying. I'm about to pray in the spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another realm of this that I know most of y'all not ready for, so I'm not going to go into it. But Paul also talking about groanings that cannot be uttered of men. He talked about how the Spirit would pray through us with groanings. The Bible says in the book of Exodus, when God came down to Moses and he told them, I have, I have heard, the, he says, and the children of, and the, and the Hebrews groaned unto God and God heard them. So in intercession, you may be praying in tongues or you in your devotional life, you may be praying and then those tongues may turn into a, a groan. The Bible says that when Jesus walked up to the grave of Lazarus when he was dead, that he groaned within himself. So there are different signs. Now, I know y'all gonna think this is crazy, but most of y'all don't even cast out devils, so I don't care what you think. But there are different sounds even in the spirit. The Lord talks about in the book of Isaiah about how the Lord descends from heaven with a cry, with a cry of war. So 
there are times when you may be praying in the spirit in your devotional way, not necessarily tongues and interpretation, but there are times when you may be praying in the spirit and a sound may, may come out of you. A cry of war may come out of you. A groan may come out of you because sound has the capacity to move things, barriers, all kinds of stuff. Y'all not ready for that. So let me move on. Anyway, um, so uh, Jude chapter one talks about a command to pray in the Holy Ghost. He says, as you pray in the Holy Ghost, he says, you keep yourself from the garment that is stained. He, he talks about building yourself up. The Amplified Version says, building yourself up literally like an edifice, right? So let's say you're praying in tongues and you start there and you begin to pray and develop your prayer language. Because most of us, if we pray in tongues, then what happens is we pray in tongue, that singular one. Ho, ba, 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 ba. Hey, and that's it, you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> when you pray in tongues, it's full language. It's 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 full uh, a, a breath of language, right? B R E A D T H, a breath of language, right? And the Bible says in the in in, in the book of Jude chapter one, you my brethren pray in the Holy Ghost, right? And he says building yourself up like an edifice. Now what that literally means is a temple, a building, a edifice, and every edifice houses something. In an edifice and in a room, you've got spaces, you've got rooms. In an in a edifice, you've got windows, you've got doors, you've got the first floor, you've got the second floor, you've got the third floor, you've got the basement, you've got the attic, you got you got the bedroom, you got the bathroom, you got rooms in this edifice. So if your life, if he says pray and make yourself like an edifice, is what he's saying is pray and make your life like it's building. Keep yourself building in the Holy Ghost. So there's no way to pray in tongues and stay with the same level of language and the same level of, 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 of expression by the Spirit if the Bible is saying that you are building yourself up as an edifice, an edifice where there is vision and power and grace and authority. So yes, praying in tongues is a way to build yourself up. If you don't believe me, try sinning and try falling in your flesh by praying in tongues. It's just not going to work right. If you in a hotel, motel, Holiday Inn, and R. Kelly on the side talking about my mind's telling me no, but my body, my body's telling me hey, hey. no, and you start talking in tongues, I'm telling you now, that thing going to run right off. You cannot be turned on talking in tongues. The same is true with, with, with if you're reading your Bible. It's difficult to, to sit in your scripture and not get insight into the 23rd Psalms if you pray in tongues while you're studying your Bible. If you crack that stuff open, the Bible says some of that stuff is locked, right? So what happens is, is you begin to pray in the spirit and do what Paul said, which is to sow into the spirit or invest into the spirit. What happens is something happens where you change seats and, and what was going on where your soul was in the driver's seat. Now you're being steered by the spirit and in the spirit and for the spirit, right? It's difficult. You can't stay in your flesh if you're praying in tongues the whole time. It just it just don't work that way, you know? Uh, have you ever, you know, been been horny or feeling like you're about to fall in lust or you're about to go smoke or drink and, 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 and uh, just imagine trying to fulfill and manifest that stuff and praying in the Holy Ghost. It's not going to work. You problem with you people in repetitive sin and fornication and pornography and masturbation and you people that's been saved 40 and 30 years that still got your tail falling asleep in prayer and still falling asleep when you try to read your Bible, you need to pray in the Holy Ghost until energy comes upon you. You're not going to be able to do it long and not have something turn on in you. But praying in the Holy Ghost will take you through temptation. It will move you into to your next level of insight. There have been times that I've been in my Bible praying in the Spirit and scriptures would jump out. I would get meanings that I didn't necessarily know about scriptures. That the wells of revelation and wisdom would begin to open up. When I don't know what to preach on a Sunday, the night before, I'm in tongues. I'm not about to Google and YouTube your favorite religious preachers. I'm going to pray in the Holy Ghost because he knows the mind of God and he knows what's going on. So if there is a weakness, the Bible says in Romans 8, the spirit knows our, no, tongues ain't passing under the weight. It's not in the Bible. The Bible says that the spirit knows the mind 
mind of God. And the Bible says that he who searcheth the mind of God knows what the mind of the spirit is. So praying in tongues and praying in the spirit is one of the ways that you tap the mind of God. You know what's in his mind. You get access to what's in his mind concerning the scripture, concerning your kids, concerning. So praying in tongues will bring you into a new degree of spiritual, uh, of, of sensitivity to the realm of the spirit. When I begin to pray in tongues daily, the gifts of the spirit turned on in my life on steroids. I would be praying in tongues and I would know people's names. I would know their birthdays. I would know where folk live. I would go in the malls and I would know if people, how many kids people have. The Lord would tell me about my waiter. She's got uh, 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 two children. One of them is a boy. One of them is a girl. And by two different baby daddies, she got a five day notice. I'm telling you, I've always, I always had the gifts, but when I began to make a regular habit of praying in tongues, my gifts went on steroids. They blew up. Why? Because the gift of the spirit got behind those gifts and strengthened them and took them from glory to glory and strength to strength. So tongues is one of the ways and praying in them is one of the ways you keep your flesh subdued. You keep your opinions in their place. You keep your soul in check. You keep your fears out of your way. You raise up your most holy faith. There is no stronger faith than the faith that you have that is most holy. So even when you believe in God about something, I spend time praying in the Holy Ghost. When I see a building, when I see something I want, when there's a, an anointing for money. Why? Because I'm like Paul. I pray in tongues more than all of you. <laughs> so here's what you're going to do. Here's my challenge to you. My phone is dying. <laughs> Believe God to fill you afresh with the Holy Ghost. Study this out. Let me go connect to my charger. And the Apostle Paul I'm married to is actually upstairs because my wife is actually Paul. But get you some books. A tremendous book on this issue or this subject matters is 70 Reasons for Speaking in Tongues by Bishop Bill Hammond. You can get that. And it's a tremendous book. I need to come up here and plug this up on my charger real quick. Do you speak in tongues? Yes, I do. Often? Yes. Okay. Why? Give my Periscope audience two reasons why you speak in tongues. Every day. Do you speak in tongues every day? Yeah. Why? Because it builds me up. It builds up my faith. Does it give you endurance? It gives me endurance and it reveals mysteries. Come on, keep going. I just got through bragging on you about why you the Apostle Paul. Say something. <laughs> A ta ta ta. Tell my people. It's based off of Jude. Jude 123, right. Yeah. But has anything happened to you while you were praying in tongues before that changed you? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the greatest thing that happens is that mysteries are, re like revelation comes to me very um, quickly when I pray in the Holy Spirit. So things are made clear to you? Very quickly, yeah. Okay, good. It's miraculously, actually. Oh, oh, now you want to add that on and be haughty. <laughs> she need to pray in tongues a little more to humble herself, bring her soul. So yeah, um, that is my admonishment to you. Okay, here's my challenge. If you're going to take my challenge, do like this. Now, if you're a leader, you need to pray in tongues to make your vision clear. If you are if you are an intercessor, you need to pray in tongues until your prayer skill begins to change and God takes you in the level and the lanes of prayer. If you are somebody that's looking for deeper insight into the scriptures, there's no greater way to get insight than to actually talk to the author. Get in touch with them. And don't just let the devil shut you down. Begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. And you ain't got to wait for the Christmas lights to go off or for the shouting music to stop or the tambourine to start before you pray in tongues. Tongues need to be a part of your devotion. All right. Y'all ready? Who's going to take my challenge? Who's going to take my challenge? All right. Here's what I want you to do. For the, for the rest of this month, every day for the rest of this month, I want you to pray in tongues at least one hour. I don't care how else you pray uh, every other day. I do believe in anointing with oil. I'm an oil slinger. Uh, um, I want all of you pray in tongues one hour a day. I don't care how else you pray, you can, but at, at least one day, pray in tongues. And I want, I'm gonna check in and I'm gonna find out if you notice a difference. Let's make a little science project here. I'm going to check back in and see if you notice a change in you, a change in your attitude, a change in your revelation level, a change in your power level, a change in your patience, a change in your perspective. I just want to see if it's a change. So I want to make sure you pray in tongues an hour a day and see what happens. Maybe your preaching change. What? If nothing happens, then stop. If, 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 if something does happen, then let me know what it is. All right? So that is your challenge. 
I'm doing it on my sabbatical, but I actually prefer to pray in tongues over English if it's up to me. It, but sometimes I don't need to. I just I'll just um, do it in English, but I actually prefer to pray in tongues. But that's your homework. I think I do Bo too. You what? I think I prefer to pray in tongues. I do too, except for something I know I need to say. All right, all right. So go in starting today. Set that clock, that 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 clock or alarm. Put you on some music. Put your hand on your belly, and let the devil have a headache <laughs> and build yourself up. All right, we're starting tonight. All right, scope. Listen to you. That's my challenge. Spread the word. We're gonna pray in the spirit for an hour every day. Build yourself up and let it happen. All right, in your now. Most holy thing. Yeah, in your most holy thing. Who is this white boy on here? That ain't got the Holy Ghost telling y'all not to do it. Boy, listen, you ain't filled with the Holy Ghost. This conversation is a little too big with you. Stop uh, trying to move my periscope people into your demonic doctrines of cessationism. This is not the right uh, 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 periscope for you. All right. Anyway, and look, look, look I mean, the polar thing sitting up in here. This is the wrong periscope. This is, this is not for you. We believe in casting out devils. All right. Now. So let's go, let's get that thing cracking and pray in the Holy Ghost, see what's going on, and uh, I'll get back to you. If you are coming to my conference October the 28th uh, through uh, November the 2nd, uh, then I want you to let me know World Changer Summit is going to be off the chain. So pray for me while I'm on my sabbatical. I'm not just looking pretty. I mean, of course, y'all see that because I look real rough today. But I'm actually praying in the Holy Ghost, building myself up. God is getting me ready in my life in my soul, in my inner man for what's coming up. A season is cracked open and I want to be sure that I ain't missed it. All right. I love you guys. I will see you soon.